Okay, hi. Uh, once again, this will be the lecture for the beginning of week 10. So the lecture for um, Tuesday, <clears throat> March 23rd. Uh, as you guys know, we are beginning um, uh, our look <clears throat> at uh, the fourth and final of the major early modern traditions of thinking and talking about love that we are looking at in our course uh, and that is, uh, of course, the Ovidian uh, tradition. Um, our main text for this tradition over the next two weeks is going to be a selection, as you know, from book three of Spencer's Fairy Queen, and I want to get to that in a moment. Um, but before doing that, I want to introduce what we are talking about when we are talking about Ovidian stuff. <clears throat> Um, somewhat like uh, the Petrarchan and Neoplatonic traditions that we looked at earlier in the course, when we are talking about uh, Ovidian uh, literature or art, we are talking about um, a tendency um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, ba is based on or comes down to the work of uh, one guy, in this case the Roman poet Ovid, whose dates are uh, 43 BC to 17 CE, or what used to be called AD. So that's a little over uh, 2,000 years ago at the beginning of the Roman imperial period, the period of the emperors, uh, in other words. Um, <clears throat> and when we talk Ovid, when we talk about the Ovidian tradition in the uh, early modern literary classroom, we're talking above all about the influence of Ovid's great work, a uh, long, long poem called The Metamorphoses, which I want to talk a little bit about by way of introducing this part of our course. <clears throat> Metamorphoses, of course, means changes or transformations. Uh, and that's what that poem uh, is about. Uh, it is a comprehensive retelling by Ovid of the Greek, which is also the Roman uh, mythological tradition. Uh, he's not making this stuff up, uh, Ovid. He's uh, looking at, uh, reconsidering, we might say, the stories of the deeds and misdeeds of, of gods and mortals, which form the whole basis uh, for his culture uh, and he's retelling those stories in uh, a very brilliant, poetic uh, way. Um, and um, <clears throat> what Ovid has perceived and what he um, tries to show us uh, in uh, the Metamorphoses um, is, I, I guess, two things. Uh, first, he has perceived that if you look at the whole uh, Greco-Roman mythology thing, which we all, uh, even to this day, learn about to some extent, uh, whether on purpose or by accident. <coughs> Ovid perceives that all those stories, or at least a very great many of those stories, have a common element, I mean a common narrative element, which is precisely the element of transformation or change. A and I mean, and he means, uh, the, the, the physical change uh, in the, the, the very forms of the beings, uh, whether gods uh, or mortals, who take part in uh, those stories. Um, the gods in those myths are, of course, always taking on different forms, which they uh, can do effortlessly, most notably um, for Ovid. Uh, he's going to think a lot about uh, the uh, habit, let's say, that uh, Zeus or Jupiter, the king of the gods, has uh, in uh, those myths of, of, of taking on various forms, a swan, a bull, a, um, a shower of golden coins, uh, in order to get access to human women. Um, but also, and frequently as a result of uh, intervention by the gods in these stories, people are transformed. Uh, they are transformed into animals, they are transformed into trees and other plants, they're transformed into insects, 
they're transformed into constellations, uh, and they are also frequently in uh, those myths transformed into art objects, notably um, statuary. Uh, so, uh, Ovid, uh, in his great work, The Metamorphoses, he looks again at that whole Greco-Roman mythological tradition, which forms the basis for his culture, and he says, ah, I see what it's all about. It's about change, transformation, metamorphosis. Um, and that's what he um, underlines and emphasizes uh, in each and every one of those stories that he retells. <clears throat> um, uh, I said there were two things that he uh, perceives. Uh, the other thing uh, is uh, the force of it perceives that is driving these changes, these transformations in the Greek and Roman mythological tradition. And for Ovid, the force that drives these changes is precisely love, or at least <clears throat> it is sexual desire, eros. Uh, that, uh, in the Ovidian tradition, is just plain what love is, or what love will always tend to become or tend uh, to have to deal with. So there, there, there's none of this higher love stuff uh, in uh, the Ovidian tradition. There isn't even really, in a clearly uh, demarcated way, anything like parental or filial love, which isn't available for, or let's say vulnerable to, uh, contamination, maybe would be the word, uh, by the tide of uh, erotic love. Um, that kind of love, that eros uh, in Ovid uh, is what all love comes down to. Uh, and that kind of love in Ovid is ceaseless, is limitless, is insatiable, is a kind of irresistible power, overflowing all boundaries and defeating all barriers um, as this kind of flow, as this kind of force, uh, erotic desire in Ovid is formless, shapeless. It's like the ocean, it's like the air. Uh, and perhaps that is why that power, that force of the erotic uh, in Ovid and in the Ovidian tradition always, let's say, reserves for itself the right to destroy and alter the forms of the beings uh, with whom it interacts, whether they be people, whether they be uh, immortals, or what have you, turning them into something else, change after change after change after change. Uh, and I, I've shared with you on our Canvas module in a handout just one little tiny example from Ovid's uh, metamorphoses. Um, and it's, as we'll see, it's a highly, uh, let's say, relevant example for the work we're going to do with Spencer over the next couple of weeks because it's the story of Venus and Adonis. I've just given you two pages from uh, from a modern translation of the metamorphoses. I believe we're looking at the translation by Alan Mandel Mandelbaum here. Um, <clears throat> the story of Venus and Adonis, uh, one of the very most famous stories from uh, Greek and Roman mythology in the Renaissance, and one of the most quintessentially Ovidian stories. Venus, of course, or, or Aphrodite in the Greek. Uh, Venus is the goddess of love, as uh, you know, and in uh, this uh, famous, if not notorious, myth, she falls in love uh, with Adonis, who is a uniquely beautiful young human Man, Now, uh, in the full version of the myth and the story that Ovid tells, Adonis himself is actually a child of incest. That is, uh, that is uh, a quintessential example, let's say, of uh, the way in which erotic love, its pursuit and its satisfaction in Ovid, as I said a moment ago, overflows all boundaries, defeats all barriers, um, uh, destroys every law and every taboo, and it is certainly uh, one of the um, most unsavory and upsetting stories that we have uh, in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, and at the very beginning of the handout that I've given you, uh, his mother, Mira, uh, prays to be uh, transformed, which is something that happens actually quite a bit in, in the Metamorphoses. People, especially women, 
uh, will actually call out for help to one or more of the gods and ask to be transformed into something else in order to get out of um, the horror of their life, basically. Mira is transformed into a tree, uh, and um, uh, this, for the uh, mythological tradition that, that Ovid is retelling, this is, this is the origin of the myrrh tree. Um, <clears throat> um, Ovid then is born from the tree, excuse me, Adonis is born from the tree in a rather remarkable episode. And then I want to go on uh, and read just a little bit uh, of the handout uh, where I have uh, drawn a pencil line there on my on my PDF. <clears throat> um, and, and I want to, I'm doing this just because I, it, it's a very brief way, but I think an effective way for us to kind of get the flavor of Ovidianism uh, in the Renaissance. So I'm picking this up uh, on, uh, it's page 347 in our, in our two-page PDF. So it's the, the start of the PDF. Uh, Adonis has just been born from uh, the tree that used to be his mother, Mira, uh, and Ovid comments, The flight of time eludes our eyes, it glides unseen, no thing is swifter than the years. Yes, he who is the son of his own sister and his grandfather was but recently enclosed within a tree, but recently a newborn, then a handsome baby boy, Adonis has become a youth, a man. His beauty now surpasses what he was, inflaming even Venus's love, and thus avenging that dread fire incestuous, which Venus made his mother Mira suffer, and that is how that and this is how that vengeance came about. One day, as Cupid, son of Venus, kissed his mother unaware, he scratched her breast, an arrow jutting from his quiver chanced to graze her. Though the goddess felt the prick and pushed her son aside, the wound was far more deep than it had seemed to her at first. Now, I, I want to pause there with that little scene of, uh, of Cupid, little baby Cupid, uh, uh, scratching or pricking his mother uh, with one of his arrows. And we know what Cupid's arrows do. They make people fall in love. That's what happens uh, to Venus. But I also uh, just want to make sure that we notice the um, extraordinarily unsavory aspects of, of that little vignette, that little moment, uh, baby Cupid playing around his mother's naked breast, pricking her with an arrow. I mean, obviously it's phallic. It's, 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 it's absurdly, excessively uh, suggestive and even perverse. Um, and um, we could do a whole kind of art history thing uh, where we would look at pictures of, of, of Cupid and Venus uh, painted in the Renaissance, I mean, and they are all uh, very typically, at least, um, creepy, uh, uh, and that's putting it mildly. Now, that's Ovid, uh, and that <clears throat> that kind of ew uh, effect that you get from uh, this little vignette of Cupid and Venus, uh, that is very much, again, giving us the flavor of this Ovidian tradition, but I'm going to read a little more now. So Venus now has been has been pricked, scratched uh, by Cupid's arrow. <clears throat> she falls in love with Adonis. So Ovid writes, and Venus now is taken by the mortal Adonis's beauty. She no longer cares for her Kithara's shores. Uh, she cannot spare the time to visit sea-encircled Paphos and Knidos, rich with fish. These are all uh, islands in the Cyclades with which uh, Venus is associated, and she neglects her Amathus, the city rich with ores. She even finds the skies too tedious. She much prefers Adonis. She stays close to him. It is with him she always goes, and she who always used to seek the shade, there she could rest at ease and cultivate her beauty, now frequents the mountain slopes, the woods, the rocks beset by spiny thorns, as if she were Diana. Diana, her chaste uh, sister, the huntress. Um, Venus is running around, uh, like that. <clears throat> uh, as if she were Diana, Venus keeps her tunic tied above her knees. She spurs the hounds and chases after game. That is, those beasts whom it is safe to hunt. The hares that leap headlong, the stags with branching horns or does. But she is careful to avoid stout boars, rapacious wolves, bears armed with claws, and lions stained with the blood of slaughtered herds. Adonis, she would warn you, too, to stay away from those fierce beasts. Be bold, she says, when you approach the timid animals, those who are quick to flee. But do not be audacious when you face courageous beasts. Dear boy, do not be reckless when the risk involves me, too. Don't let me lose you just because you wanted glory. Don't provoke those animals whom nature has armed well. 
<clears throat> so, um, a sudden, dense sequence of stories that Ovid gives us there from the mythological tradition. Uh, Mira, uh, Adonis being born uh, from the tree, growing up into a youth, Cupid and Venus, Venus falling in love with Adonis, Venus, uh, as it were, being almost transformed into Diana, or at least her behavior is transformed into Diana's kind of behavior, change after change after change after change, uh, all kind of saturated uh, with this um, erotic force which is always in danger of becoming perverse. That's that's Ovid, uh, and that's Ovidianism. Um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Venus, at the end of that little tiny selection that I just read, Venus is, is urging Adonis, her, her beautiful young lover, uh, who is a hunter, um, she's urging him you know, only hunt the safe animals. Don't go after the scary ones because I don't want them to kill you. That, that of course, is exactly what's going to happen in the Adonis uh, myth. He's going to be killed by a wild boar. Um, uh, Venus, uh, in the rest of this part of Book 10, which we don't have in our PDF, she, she, she tries to persuade him uh, to play it safe by telling him a story, the story of, uh, of Atlanta uh, and, and the golden apples. Um, and this is what Ovid does. He weaves story after story after story, change after change after change, you know, this great, uh, seemingly unending thread, until you do come to the end of the Metamorphoses, seemingly unending thread uh, of erotic uh, transformation. Um, okay. Um, Now, uh, The Metamorphoses is, I'll just say, an absolutely stunning work. Um, it, it is frequently creepy. It is sometimes genuinely disturbing. Uh, but for all that, uh, an incredible read. And um, also functions for us, and I'm going to wrap up my comments on Ovid actually really quickly, but uh, the, the, metamor the Metamorphoses also kind of functions for us as a kind of encyclopedia, a brilliant poetic encyclopedia of uh, the Greco-Roman mythological tradition. So um, <clears throat> if, uh, for whatever reason, you kind of want to brush up on that stuff, you know, you can add the Metamorphoses to your summer beach reading and you will have, um, I think, a very enthralling uh, course uh, in Greek and Roman mythology. So it's a kind of encyclopedia of that tradition for us, and that's what it was for the Renaissance. Um, I gave you guys a PowerPoint uh, also on the Canvas module of a, a, a long sequence of, of Renaissance paintings based on Ovid's retelling of Greek myths. Um, and, you know, it's that, um, it's that space that you go into if you ever visit uh, any of the great uh, art museums of the world, <clears throat> uh, you know, perhaps as a teenager or whatever, getting dragged through those, those, those painting galleries by your parents and you're like, oh, if I have to see another half-naked god doing something or other with another half-naked, ah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to throw up. Well, uh, again, that's, that's off it. That's the Avidian tradition, and um, I guess, I guess all we really need to know right now, for our purposes, is that strange though it is, ancient though it is, creepy though it is, Ovid really provides the uh, artistic register, uh, let's say, of the High Renaissance, and that's why, of course, we're learning about it. Okay, so that is a brief sketch of the tradition itself. Let's go on now to our um, specifically English literary text, uh, which is working with that tradition, and that is, again, our selection from Book 3 of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. And I've asked you guys to read from the 12 parts or cantos of that book. I've asked you to read cantos 1, 4, and 6. 
Uh, we met Spencer, as you guys will recall, much earlier in our course when we were learning about Petrarch and stuff. We read a bit of his Amoretti <clears throat> uh, sonnet sequence, and I hope you will recall, since it is week 10 and we have to start thinking about uh, review and final exam matters and all that kind of stuff, I hope you will recall that Spencer in the Amoretti, uh, as I said at that time, he's he's taking that Petrarchan tradition and changing it up to some extent, <clears throat> uh, doing something different uh, with it. Um, the, 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 the tradition needs to be there for him to be able to do that, but he, he does want to move it in a different direction. I think we'll find him doing something quite similar with the Ovidian tradition in Book 3 of The Fairy Queen. Um, Fairy Queen uh, is Spencer's great work, his life's work, his masterpiece, just as the Metamorphoses is Ovid's uh, masterpiece. Uh, it appears in two editions, two forms uh, in Spencer's lifetime. There's a, a, a three-book version of The Fairy Queen published in 1590, and then an extended, expanded six-book version published in 1596, just before he died. And, and as I said, a couple of years before he died, uh, as I said uh, in the uh, canvas mail I sent out about this, Spencer's plan was to write 12 books of The Fairy Queen, possibly even 24 books of The Fairy Queen. So my goodness, um, just imagine uh, that, because uh, 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 <clears throat> six is a ton of the Fairy Queen, six books, and three even is plenty, uh, I think. The Fairy Queen uh, is an epic poem, and there is a kind of technical definition of what makes a poem an epic poem that we don't need to worry about too much, okay? Uh, all we really need to know is that an epic poem is... Uh, is a very long uh, narrative poem. So it's a very long poem that tells a story or a sequence of stories. And it's kind of the, um, the ambition of every Renaissance poet to write an epic poem. So this is, this is Spencer's fulfillment of that uh, ambition. Um, uh, another element uh, of the Fairy Queen, an introductory element or framing element, I mean, that we do need to know something about is that the Fairy Queen is what we call a romance epic. A romance epic. Romance here <clears throat> doesn't mean uh, having anything to do uh, with uh, romantic love, uh, actually. Uh, a romance is rather a certain kind of medieval story, uh, basically. It's a story of, of knights and ladies. That's a romance. So you're in a romance world in this sense. You're reading a romance narrative if you're reading a story of, of knights on horseback, armored knights on horseback, uh, riding around uh, the countryside uh, doing what they do, which is basically when they meet each other, they fight, uh, they try to uh, secure the love of women, uh, they meet hermits and magicians and they attack castles and stuff like that. So, um, <clears throat> knights and ladies, gentle deeds, that's romance. And uh, Spencer's epic is a romance epic in the sense that it follows uh, those kinds of figures, those kinds of characters wandering around in an imaginary world that Spencer has come up with, which he calls Fairyland, uh, which is thought of as... Um, a kind of uh, fantasy version of Elizabethan England, uh, maybe we can say. Uh, as I was saying a moment ago, uh, in its full form, The Fairy Queen is, is six books, six books of 12 parts or cantos uh, each. Each book of The Fairy Queen stars a specific knight, uh, and each knight embodies a specific virtue. In other words, a specific aspect of human morality. So, book one of the Fairy Queen, which you might well encounter in other courses, stars a knight called the, the Red Cross Knight, and he is the knight of holiness, piety. He is supposed to embody that virtue. Book two, the protagonist, is a knight called Guyon, uh, who embodies the virtue of temperance. 
uh, which doesn't mean in Renaissance English, it doesn't mean not drinking alcohol, rather it means being dignified and, uh, and prudent and in control of yourself. That's temperance. Book three of The Fairy Queen, our book, stars, as you guys know, a knight called Brittlemart, and Brittlemart is the knight of chastity. And uh, Fairy Queen, book three, accordingly, is the book of chastity. Now, what exactly chastity means, uh, that is precisely what we have to consider and Spencer is writing Fairy Queen Book 3 precisely as, as an opportunity for us to consider that, what chastity means. Um, we do, though, need to do just a little bit of, uh, of introductory work on that term so that we are not hopelessly misled by it, let's say, at the very beginning. Chastity in early modern England doesn't just mean virginity, it doesn't just mean celibacy. You may recall uh, weeks ago uh, we took a very brief look at, at Shakespeare's very strange little poem called The Phoenix and the Turtle. Remember that's the poem about the marriage between the, the, the phoenix and, and, and a turtle dove. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare uses the phrase in that poem at one point to describe their relationship. He says it, it was a relationship of, of married chastity, married chastity, which strikes us as a kind of contradiction in terms. Uh, in English Renaissance terms, it's not. Uh, married chastity uh, is a concept that makes perfect sense to them. Uh, in fact, we could even, looking back to Spencer's Amoretti, we could say that Spencer's Amoretti, in which, as you recall, he actually gets uh, his beloved and marries her, we could say that Spencer's Amoretti is entirely directed toward an end point of married chastity. <clears throat> that doesn't mean a, a, a sexless marriage, N not at all. Uh, it, it means something more like an appropriate management or focusing of sexuality within marriage. That, that's married chastity. So, um, again, uh, Spencer's writing this whole long book of the Fairy Queen to try and explore what chastity means and what all the implications of chastity are. All we need to understand from the get-go is that it doesn't mean having nothing to do with sexuality. Rather, it means having a certain kind of attitude toward, se toward sexuality, an attitude uh, which is uh, perhaps appropriately uh, managed, an attitude perhaps of moral regulation, an attitude, um, well, which is moral, uh, to put that very, very vaguely. Um, uh, and we're gonna see, I think, over the next two weeks, that Spencer's vision of sexuality in the Book of Chastity, Book Three of the Fairy Queen, is actually quite a remarkable um, and uh, we can even say compelling one, but we'll, we'll try to see that when uh, we come to it. Now we might ask, <laughs> um, why, given, that, given everything that we just learned earlier in the lecture today about, about Ovid and about Ovidian eroticism, even Ovidian perversity, uh, we might ask, why are we reading the Book of Chastity, Fairy Queen Book 3, as our literary text for this module, the module on the Ovidian tradition. Well, uh, it is because uh, book three of the Fairy Queen is by far uh, the most erotic of, uh, of the books of the Fairy Queen. Uh, this book of chastity is absolutely filled with sexuality of all kinds. Uh, and uh, Spencer is very explicitly in every sense of that word, very explicitly invoking and working with the Ovidian tradition in uh, this book. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it seems like there's, uh, on the face of it, kind of a contradiction there, but I don't think there is. I would say, rather, there is a tension or a dynamic between Ovidianism and uh, Spencer's attempt to think about this virtue of chastity in book three of the Fairy Queen. Um, 
Uh, and I think we can we can make sense of that, or at least see how that possibly can make sense right here at the beginning rather quickly, uh, just by uh, looking back to what we have been uh, saying about Ovid uh, so far today. Uh, and, and we can summarize that by saying, you know, in, in Ovid, Eros, sexuality, in various ways, it's a problem. It's always going too far. Um, doing things it shouldn't do, leading to results it shouldn't have. It's always making us go, ew, uh, Ovidian eroticism. Precisely insofar as it is a problem, it stands in need of a solution of Vidian eroticism, uh, I mean. Uh, and that, I think, is what Spencer is trying to imagine, trying to envision in Book 3 of The Fairy Queen. Because um, uh, after all, I think, from Spencer's point of view, and perhaps from ours as well, uh, we're going to be able to look at the, you know, world of uh, human erotic relations and uh, we are quickly going to be able to notice um, that there's some dark and disturbing parts of uh, that world and yet uh, we perhaps are not going to want to respond to that problem by saying well we don't want to have anything to do with that uh, rather we may hope to uh, arrange that world of human sexuality, let's say, or manage our relations with that world in such a way that we uh, get what it has to offer without uh, getting uh, caught up in uh, those dark and disturbing uh, corners that it has. That, I think, is what uh, Spencer is trying to envision, uh, trying to make sense of in Book 3 of uh, The Fairy Queen. And we'll see as we go along uh, whether we think he succeeds at that or not. Okay, in the remainder of this lecture, let's just then turn to uh, the beginning of our reading and just kind of orient ourselves uh, in uh, Book 3. Um, <clears throat> we begin in Canto 1, and this is a little bit confusing, so I do want to try to clarify it just at a narrative level. We begin in Canto 1 uh, with a kind of um, denouement uh, or after effect of the previous book of the Fairy Queen, um, uh, book two, uh, in which uh, the the lead knight, as I said, is a knight called Guyon. He has all kinds of adventures, of course, uh, in one of which he meets uh, Prince Arthur. Um, so Guyon is thought of as a knight from this fairy land, so you'll see him referred to as a fairy knight. Uh, Prince Arthur is, is the English uh, person who is to become King Arthur, and he has, like, made his way into fairyland somehow or other. So anyway, he and Guyon have various adventures. Uh, we, we begin uh, book three with uh, Spencer kind of wrapping that up and then introducing us to the next episode. Um, and that, uh, too, is a point worth underlining uh, or, or shining a light on just for a minute. <clears throat> uh, the Fairy Queen... Is a, is a narrative poem, so it's a poem that tells a story, but, but, but maybe uh, it's more accurate and helpful to say that the Fairy Queen is a poem that tells stories. It's very much an episodic narrative, so we go from episode to episode. Um, sometimes the, the episodes uh, um, kind of lead into each other in an organic way. Sometimes they don't. Uh, and it can become quite confusing. So uh, let's just be aware that when we are reading a Fairy Queen Book 3, it's not exactly one continuous story as we would get if we were reading a novel or watching a movie. It's more like a somewhat random uh, collection of stories which Spencer has found a way um, to, to hook together. Uh, and um, it may actually be helpful to think in terms of a, a, a kind of gaming uh, approach to narrative. And, and by the way, when we're reading The Fairy Queen, we certainly are reading um, one of the sources of, you know, every, uh, <clears throat> you know, Assassin's Creed or whatever type uh, narrative game that you might play. Um, 
So uh, we can we it may be helpful to think of it in terms of a gaming narrative in which again you go from episode to episode uh, according to a logic which may be sometimes a little bit random. So we just have to try not to get confused. Okay, that's the that's the summary of that rather untidy point that I just tried to make. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to pick this up. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit uh, from uh, Canto 1, uh, uh, stanza 3. We're looking here at Arthur and Guyon, okay? And Spencer writes, Long so they traveled through wasteful ways where dangers dwelt and perils most did won or, or dwell or live. To hunt for glory and renowned praise. Full many countries they did overrun from the uprising to the setting sun, and many hard adventures did achieve. Of all the which they honor ever won, seeking the weak oppressed to relieve and to recover right for such as wrong did grieve. At last, as through an open plain they yode, rode, at last, as through an open plain they yode, they spied a knight that towards pricked fair, so they see a knight riding toward them. And him beside, an aged squire there rode, that seemed to couch under his shield three square, as if that age bade him that burden spare, and yielded those that stouter it could wield. He, this strange knight approaching, he them espying, gan himself prepare, and on his arm address his goodly shield that bore a lion passant in a golden field. So what's happening here? Uh, in uh, stanza four of Canto One, is we're we're entering into the next episode of uh, Spencer's long, long, complex narrative thread. Guyon and Arthur see a strange knight coming uh, toward them across the field. The knight does what knights do in the romance world when knights meet other knights. Um, you know, it's a bit like, you know, what, what, what do dogs do when they meet other dogs? Well, they, they go up and they sniff each other and all that stuff. Um, what do knights do when they meet other knights in the romance world? Well, they prepare for fight and they do fight. That's kind of how they say hi. It, 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 sometimes it goes badly. Sometimes it does not. This is one of the episodes where actually it, it doesn't go badly at all. Um, but if you're a knight... Um, this is how you greet other knights. When you see them coming along, you, 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 you drop everything and you go straight in to battle. That's what happens here. So this strange knight starts riding at them in a battle posture. Uh, now I'm at stanza five. Which seeing good Sir Guyon, dear besought the Prince of Grace to let him run that turn. In other words, Guyon says to Arthur, Oh, Prince Arthur, let me take this guy. Uh, he, Arthur, granted. Please note, you guys, um, you know, reading Spencer's Fairy Queen, it, it's almost a kind of skill in itself. One thing that happens uh, in, in Spencer's narrative is that he gets very, very untidy with pronouns, okay? He, him, his. Uh, you have to really follow along closely to figure out uh, the antecedent of those pronouns. Like if I were marking Spencer's work, I'd be saying, you know, Who's he here? I'm confused. Uh, Spencer leaves us to do that work. We just kind of have to accept it and, and, and do it. Um, the reason it works that way is because actually Spencer's, Spencer has given himself uh, an incredibly difficult poetic task. He's working with a very complex stanza that he invented, with a complex rhyming scheme that he invented. It's, not, it's absolutely incredible, uh, the achievement of the Fairy Queen. Um, he cuts himself some slack, so to speak, on those pronouns. So... Uh, just please be aware that we have to be very careful, uh, you know, to whom his he's and him's and his's refer. So, which seeing good Sir Guyon, dear besought the Prince of Grace to let him run that turn. He, Arthur, granted. Then the fairy, Guyon, quickly wrathed his poignant spear and sharply began to spurn his foamy steed, whose fiery feet did burn the verdant grass as he thereon did tread. Nay did the other back his foot return, but fiercely forward came without in dread, and bent his dreadful spear against the other's head. They be met, and both their points arrived, but Guyon drove so furious and fell, that seemed both shield and plate it would have writhed. Natheless it bore his foe not from his cell, his seat, but made him stagger, as he were not well. But Guyon's self, ere well he was aware, nigh a spear's length behind his crooper fell. Yet in his fall so well himself he bare that mischievous mischance his life and limbs did spare. Um, if we can kind of uh, get up to speed with uh, Spencer's vocabulary, his diction, 
uh, which, by the way, is an, an old-fashioned on-purpose diction. It's a very odd thing that Spencer does. Um, uh, even for his fellow late Elizabethans, Spencer is using weird words here, okay? He's doing that very much on purpose. They're meant to sound medieval-y. Um, but if we can uh, get up to speed with Spencer's narrative, basically it's it's all violence. So if 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 you like uh, uh, that sort of thing, um, well, the Fairy Queen is your text. What has happened here is that Guyon and uh, this strange knight have ridden at each other in jousting fashion. They have they have met their their, their long spears making contact with the other. Uh, the strange knight has been rocked in, in his saddle, but hasn't fallen off his horse. Guyon, however, is pushed right off his horse and a spear's length behind. So he's actually humiliated, Guyon is, in this initial meeting with this strange knight. And uh, he is very, very annoyed by that. Normally what you would do uh, in the romance world if you have been... Uh, bested in that initial contact, that jousting style contact with spears, normally you'd get really mad, you'd whip out your sword, and um, and the, 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 the fight goes into another stage where you, you, you have an extended uh, sword fight. That doesn't happen in this case because Guyon's, uh, Guyon is riding with a, 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 an assistant called a Palmer, uh, and he perceives that this strange knight is something quite special. So he, he, he perceives Guyon to make friends with this strange knight, uh, whom, we all, whom, whom we are still uh, in the narrative referring to as he. Uh, what we become aware of uh, very quickly, though, as readers of Fairy Queen uh, Book Three, is that this strange knight is actually a she. So we have just met Britomart for the first time, the heroine of Fairy Queen Book Three, the knight of chastity. Um, Guyon has been humiliated by the strange knight, and as Spencer comments, he would be even more humiliated if he knew that he had just been pushed off his horse by a woman. Uh, but that is uh, what happens. And in this initial, in these initial moments, these initial scenes of Fairy Queen Book Three, what we see is Britomart uh, effortlessly, you know, wasting um, macho knight after macho knight. Um, uh, So, um, Guyon and uh, Britomart manage to uh, make friends. Uh, they ride along together uh, until they are separated, uh, uh, beginning at stanza 15. I won't read this part. I'll just summarize what happens here. This is one of those moments in the Fairy Queen where it's possible for us to get a little bit confused. Basically, Guyon and Arthur and, and Britomart are riding along, you know, best of friends, uh, when they suddenly see a, a beautiful lady come come riding out of the thickest brush, uh, fleeing, uh, she is being pursued by a, a, a person whom uh, Spencer refers to in stanza seventeen as a grizzly foster. That that means a a kind of greasy forest guy, uh, a grizzly foster who's running after her in order to defile her. Um, the two male knights run after, ride after this uh, lady who's being chased by the uh, greasy forest guy. Uh, and so Britomart is left alone at stanza 19. Uh, Spencer writes, The wild's fair Britomart, whose constant mind would not so lightly follow beauty's chase, nay rective lady's love, did stay behind, and them awaited there a certain space to wait if they would turn back to that place. But when she saw them gone, she forward went, as lay her journey through that perilous pace, with steadfast courage and stout hardiment. Nay evil thing she feared, nay evil thing she meant. And at that point, uh, Book 3, Canto 1, Stanza 19, we are kind of at the beginning of what Spencer wants to think about and imagine in Book 3 of The Fairy Queen. Britomart, this female knight, riding out across the landscape on her own account, to find adventures. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up pretty soon here, I think. Uh, the first adventure that, that Britomart has uh, in the remainder of Canto 1 
involves a location called Castle Joyous. Um, and we'll deal with this more on Thursday. Basically, she, uh, she comes upon uh, a scene where six knights are attacking one guy, uh, and she asks them why. There's this whole complex story. Well, every knight that rides by here has to say our lady is the greatest lady ever. Uh, and if he refuses to do that, we have to fight with him and kill him. Uh, Bredomart uh, wastes all these knights, and she is then welcomed into the castle uh, that they come from, a castle called, as I said, Castle Joyous. Uh, castle Joyous, and this is really kind of where our work gets going uh, for this module. Castle Joyous is very much represented to us as an Ovidian uh, location. Uh, an and Ovidian location uh, in the full kind of um, unlimited erotic sense that we have been talking about in the lecture today. So what we'll want to do next time is look at how Brittle Mart, let's say, comports herself uh, in this Ovidian uh, scenario. And we'll also want to pay attention to uh, the art that she looks at in Castle Joyous, and it is art that represents, among other things, precisely the love of Venus and Adonis, okay? So that's where Spencer's work with Ovid really gets going, and that's where our work with Spencer can really get going, but I think we'll leave that until uh, next time. Okay, thank you very much, as always, for watching, you guys, and I will see some of you on Thursday.